Grace is free, but it ain't cheap. You're cheap and I'm cheap, but Grace is not cheap. Isn't just one of those things people say like he's taking you down the primrose path. It's a fool's paradise. Yeah, it's the idea that, you know, you just get saved and you're already in and nothing else matters. So I can do whatever I want, throw up a few Hail Marys and I'm good to go. Right. I'm Brian Phipps and I am ready to tip a cow. Are you? Let's tip one. <laughs> well, that's what we're doing. We're in this cow tipping series, and what we're doing is taking some sacred cows or some prominent beliefs that have been in the church for a time, holding them up to Scripture to see if they hold water. In fact, that's the big idea of the series. If you'll grab your note sheet out with me, go ahead and fill in that big idea there. The big idea for the whole series is that Jesus expects us to examine all of our beliefs in the light of Scripture. It's Scripture that we find God's truth. It's scripture that we live from. We'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Here's the thing. I've got to admit something, this whole cow tipping idea. I'm an East Coast city boy. So I didn't quite get that when he first uh, started talking about that. I'd never known what a cow tipping was. I knew what a cow was, uh, but I'd never heard of, of, of tipping a cow. In fact, when I first came out to college in north central Oklahoma, a little town named Tonkawa, this East Boy City boy fell out of place. I got all the cowboys and all these guys with hats and boots and stuff on, and I tried to fit in. And so what I tried to do to try to fit in was ask some guys to go riding with me, but not a horse, one of these bad boys right here. Anybody ridden one of those before? Yeah, don't. That's not a good plan. But I tried. I uh, got a taste of rural life this summer. This is the East Coast City Boy, again, trying to, you know, get, get acclimated to some of these things. In Roach, Missouri. Now, if Roach ain't rural, I don't know what is. But that's literally the name of the town, Roach, Missouri. We were on the family canoe trip. We were on the bus coming back from the canoe ride. And as we were going along, my eyes fell upon the beautiful scenery called an automobile graveyard. Acres and acres and acres of abandoned cars and farm equipment and, and other things like that, trucks. And, and quite honestly, when I first started seeing that, I started giving thanks for my homeowner's dues that keeps the kind of rules around my house that that does not happen. But this, and, and you would too if you saw this thing. I'm telling you, it was ugly. But the second thought that I had was one that kind of crept on me as the bus kept going down the highway and more and more vehicles uh, were in my view. And, and it happened like this. I saw an old Pontiac Firebird. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking... Yeah, that's about it right there. I didn't know that was coming up, but uh, I'm glad it is. I like that. Saw this old Pontiac Firebird, ugly looking thing. And, and here's what happened to me. I, I saw that there and I, uh, I pictured it a long time ago when some 17-year-old boy had just finished earning enough money to buy it and drove on to the high school parking lot for the first time. And I thought, man, the power, the glory, the, the, the you know, I mean, it's, it's an awesome car. And I thought, why? Well, that's you see the picture there. You can identify it. it's an image of what it was, but it's far from how it was created. And then I saw a combine uh, there. It, yeah, I do know what a combine is. I looked it up. This big old thing that harvests hay and stuff like, or wheat or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's that stuff out here in the Midwest, you know. <laughs> Work with me here, people. I'm trying. <laughs> And I saw this combine rusting there, and, I could, and, I, and, and what I pictured was this farmer who had just finally worked the financing out or whatnot, and he got this new piece of equipment on his property, and he's like, man, we'll be so much more efficient, and we're going to get so much more weed in the barn and all this, and, and, and this thing was such a far cry from that day, and I saw front-end loaders, yeah, I know what those are, and other uh, trucks and stuff, and it, it just hurt me to see what was once filled with beauty, once filled with power, and once filled with life laying there rusting away its potential. And here's the spiritual aha that took place as I was going through that. God says that we, man and woman, were created in the image of God. Talk about a great way to be started. All right? But the Bible also says that that image of God is still seeable in us, but it is majorly corroded away, rusted away. Think of it, our intellects do not resonate and understand the truth of God the way we were created to be. 
In fact, if you don't like this whole idea of being rusted away, that's evidence that you don't see things the way God sees things. Our intellects are broken. They don't understand God's truth. They resist God's truth. When we don't understand and we resist God's truth, what happens to our emotions? Our emotions start to go up and down and fearful and rejectful. Same thing happened with Adam and Eve. Their emotions started going crazy and they wanted to hide with guilt and shame. That's what happens. And when our emotions are going upside down because of our uh, inability to understand the truth of God, our behaviors become erratic and unpredictable. We do the things that we don't know. We know we're not supposed to do. Yada, 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 yada. We are left broken on the side of the road in need of someone to come. And, and restore us. I saw a, uh, a great show. It's called American Restoration. If you've seen the History Channel and watched that, it's an, it's an incredible show. Rick Allen is, is kind of a uh, master restorer. And when Rick Allen gets a piece of old, just junky equipment, when he looks at it, he doesn't see junky equipment. What does he see? He sees the restored product in his mind, and he labors with all of that he has and all the gifts that he has to bring back the original beauty, to bring back the luster, to bring back the shine, to bring back what it was created to be. And the biggest aha was this. Jesus is the master restorer of lives. When he looks at you, he doesn't see broke. He sees potential. When he looks at you, he doesn't see a faltering individual. He sees someone ready to be restored back into the image in which he was created. Why set all this up? Why talk about all this? This sacred cow that I personally I'm ready to shove through a grinder and mince it up. All right? Sorry. I mean, that was... <laughs> Okay, I'm back. I'm back here. I just, just want to rip this one up. This one just gets me. Here's the sacred cow. I know, and we do this, I know I'm forgiven, and I know I'm going to heaven so I can live how I want. Here's what it looks like. Some of you are going, that ain't me. That ain't me. Here's what happens. We get to a place where we know we're going to make a decision, and this decision is the godly one, and this is the ungodly one, and we think to ourselves, I really want to do the ungodly thing. It's going to make me feel better right now. And so what do we do? We think, well, tomorrow when I get up and this is all cleared up, I can just tell, ask God to forgive me and I'm done. I'm good. And we do it. There's a cousin to this thing too. The cousin is this. I'm so beat up and corroded and messed up. I might as well do what I want because I'm beyond restoration anyway. I just caught a lot of you with that one. Right? Here's the deal with these sacred cows. They miss the point. They miss the point. Is it true that we're forgiven if we've accepted Christ as Savior and had his blood that we just sang about washed over our lives? Yes. Is it true that if we do belong to Christ, we're going to heaven? Yes. Is it true that we can do what we want, ask for forgiveness and go on? No, it misses the point. What's the point? Right here in the big idea for this teaching. Jesus came to give you life not just life insurance. He's not just a rescuer, he's a restorer. You know, he has come to bring back that original image of God that has been corrupted and corroded in your life and bring it back to all that is. We're going to be camping this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. We're going to walk through it till we get to verse 11. And I hope by the end of our time, you will share the passion that Christ has to be all of that that you can be. Look what it says here. God's divine power has given us everything we need. Will you circle that phrase, everything we need? Everything that we need for life, there's that word, life, and godliness. He's given everything you need to get back into that original image in Christ. Through our knowledge of him and called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may, and circle this phrase, participate in the divine nature. Does that mean I'm God? No, but you have that image restored back, and you just look more and more like him all of the time. One of the big pieces of our mission statement here at Westside is to become like Jesus, to have the image of God restored in us. And escape, check this out, the automobile graveyard, the rusting, the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. That's what he wants. You ready to tip this cow? Let's get it. Let's write in that first blank there, and that is prioritize what Jesus has made possible. If Jesus has made it possible for us to participate in the divine nature, then 
prioritize it. Make it first place. Look what it says here, verse 5, the very next verse. For this very reason, since it's available, make every effort to add to your faith. Make every effort to add to your faith. Put it in first place. Prioritize it. Make it number one on your agenda. This should count before anything else. Okay, that's what he's saying. Little note here. Look what it says. It says, add to your faith. Here's a, here's a very important thing. You can't create faith. That's a gift from God. Jesus gives you that faith. He lays that foundation of a spiritual journey in your life. But what he says is build on it. And not, not just build on it, but make every effort to build on it. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 comments on this verse. You'll see it here. Let's uh, look this out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Participate in it. You know, make every effort, just like Peter says. For it's God who's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you hear what he's saying? Jesus made it possible. Therefore, you make it a priority. Make it count. Leave it all on the field. The question I believe Jesus wants us to ask today of ourselves is this. What do we prioritize in our life? Is it being the best in your work? Is it your kids? Is it comfort? I mean, I'm, 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 those are there for me. I get this. It's been set up here on the platform before that our checkbooks and our calendars are great indicators of what we prioritize. So I would encourage you to examine that and ask, what am I putting before what Jesus has made possible? Being restored into the image of God. The Bible has one word to describe this. It's called idolatry. And it's the first commandment. No other gods before me. No other gods. Jesus is saying prioritize. Make this thing first. Make every effort. The sacred cow says the foundation is enough. Jesus says add big to that foundation of faith that I've laid for you. Now, here's where it's, it's so much fun. Peter gets so practical here in this next word, uh, in the next few verses that he says. How do we add to this thing? Let's look. The fill in the blank first, though. Take your next step. This might seem so ridiculously simple, and I hope that it is, but it is God-sized practical. I want to walk you through what Peter says here next. It says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Add to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. One of the things that happens to me when I hear a message like this to really prioritize being all that God has made me to be is I think of what a mature Christian in the end zone looks like and go, I can't be that tomorrow. And I get a little overwhelmed with that process. And what God is saying here through Peter is take it one step at a time. Look how practical this is. Add to your faith, what? Superhero, Christian superpowers? No. Goodness, what's that? It's a desire to do what's right. I want to be a good person. That's what a lot of people say. I want to add goodness. That's a godly thing. That's the first step. Here's the fun part. I have this new ambition to turn over a new leaf or make things new, and I want to be good, but I have a hard time doing it. Anybody else I mean, struggle with that? So we're looking for insight. We're looking for power. So what does he say to add to that goodness? Knowledge. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Start to get some, self, you know, some victories going along there. We've taken goodness, that attitude, attitude, knowledge. We start to get a few uh, wins in our life. And then what does Peter say to add? Self-control, consistency with the wins, right? Is that making sense? D don't aim for consistency with the wins first. Start here, get here, and then get here. And then it says, once you have some relative self-mastery here through my knowledge and through my power, some tough times are going to come. That doesn't mean you can just bail. Add perseverance all the way up to godliness, one step at a time. Now, if you think about this, I know not everybody is a home builder, but you've seen a house go up. When they start to build a house, they lay this concrete foundation. They put footers in. They put the foundation in and everything. And they don't do drywall next. There's nothing to hang the drywall on. You got to put the studs up. You got to frame it. You got to roof it in. And what God is saying here is don't get the cart ahead of the horse. Take one step at a time. What's your next legitimate step? And take it. 
I'm telling people that are, that, are, that are close to me, friends of mine, what does God want to see changed in your life before Christmas? Pick that one thing and give him your whole heart to get that one thing done. Because that one thing that you are thinking about right now, you've been thinking about for about 12 years. You just not prioritized it and made it an issue. Pick that one issue and go. You do that three times a year, wow. Just four months at a time. One, I had insecurity that was raging in my life at one point, and, I, and, I was, and I'm not going to explain the whole thing because it would take too long, but I said, God, I'm going to give you the whole year to erase this from my life, and I'm going to prioritize it. I'm going to make it first. My prayers are going to be all about it. Boom, done. About a year later. We have the opportunity to do that. Here's the deal. There's all kinds of stickers out there on the floor in the hallway. You probably noticed those when you came in. The idea there is to provoke questions in your own life. One of them is, do your finances need an overhaul? For some of you, you're going, uh-huh. Now, let me ask you a question. How ridiculous is it if all you can do is worry about the mortgage and the bills coming up to take a theology from Romans class? I'm not saying that Romans is invaluable. I'm saying it's going to be tough to build that kind of stuff into your life and watch it change you if all you can worry about is the wreck you're in with finances at home. What, would, what should we do? Take a godly opportunity, a godly class like financial peace that we'll be offering this fall. Take something like that. Allow God to have victory in that. There's the knowledge for the goodness, okay? And, and then let him master that, and then let me go on and do what I need to do. If you're in pain, if you're one of these folks that regularly is telling people just how bad your day has been, you're probably carrying some chronic pain or hurt from either something you've done to yourself or someone else has done to you, may I suggest that trying to work out while you're still bleeding is really tough to do. What's the first step? It's healing. We have opportunities at Westside called lifelines that are opportunities to find healing from past hurts, to find recovery from hangups. And, and, and we ask God to come in and heal those wounds so that we can begin to build on that foundation of faith that he has given us. Does this make sense? What the encouragement is, is what's God need to change and prioritize it and make that your next step spiritually. But it's not just the information that you need, folks. Let me, let me go from preaching to meddling a little bit here, sharing my life with you. You don't just need the right instruction. If it were, your self-help books and reading the Scripture on your own may have worked. But here's what we need. We need people around us who have the same passion to be restored to get there. We cannot do this on our own. The Bible says it's not good for you to be alone. I started a men's group when I was in college and I am still in one and I'll be in one till I die. Why? Because I don't trust me. I need somebody to pray for me. I need somebody to encourage me. I need somebody to look at me and say, Phipps, I, there's a blind spot in your life that you don't see. Take care of that. I need people to help me prioritize my next steps. I can't see clearly what's next. I'm going to pick the easiest thing to do. Not the right thing to do. I need people to do this. I will tell you this. In my experience, if you're not engaged in a life group, life study, lifeline, or some other form of Christian community that's aimed at restoration through Christ, you are not making every effort as we're commanded to do to see that image restored because it's the primary environment that God has given us to do so. Okay? Now, you might be asking, why bother, Phipps? Why bother? Let me give you a practical reason and then a powerful reason. The first reason that we would take our next step and prioritize this whole thing called restoration is because of this statement that a friend of mine, Christian Fisher, brought up. He said, you know, life's an uphill battle. If you're in neutral... You're going backwards. Life's an uphill battle. We all go, yep, got it. If you're in neutral, you're going backwards, and it ain't pretty. So we really practically must be going forward. We must be taking initiative. We must be prioritizing this thing in order for it to work. But practical doesn't sell me so much, and it may not sell you. So let me take you to a new place. 
a place that I've been twice this morning. When we sang that song, How Deep, did it happen to you? I'm picturing Jesus on that cross, and I started snotting with tears. I mean, I had to, I just had to wipe. I'm, I'm just seeing how could he take my punishment? How could he take my pain? How could a man with no sin take my sin so that I could be restored? I can't help but to be restored because the restorer saw me over there on the side of the road rusting away with no potential, beauty gone, power gone, life gone. And he said, no, I love Phipps too much to let him stay there. And he got off of what he was doing. He came over and he grabbed my hand. He said, Phipps, we're going to a new place. And I said, if you'll take this pile of junk, I'll go wherever you lead. Look what it says here. This passage in, in verse 9 is just so powerful. If anybody does not have these things, the goodness, the knowledge, the self-control, He's nearsighted and blind. Here's what that's saying. You've missed the point. You don't get it. You've no clue why Jesus came. You have no clue as to how much he loves you. In fact, it goes on and becomes a little bit more personal. And that person has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. We've disconnected ourselves from the reality that Jesus went all stinking in so that we could have life. If we don't accept the restoration, we've looked at the blood-stained face of Jesus and said, I really don't care. And we've raped the sacrifice of Christ. I'm driven to restoration by the love of Jesus who could not help but to give his life for me. So what's the point? Never forget the price that Jesus paid for this. I mentioned American Restoration earlier. A uh, couple months ago, American Restoration teamed up with two other History Channel shows. American Pickers and Pawn Stars. <laughs> yeah. And they, and, they, and, they, and they put together this great big show. And here's the deal. Rick Harrison, he's the main guy in Pawn Stars, and his dad was having his 70th birthday come up. You saw this. It's a great show. And so what they did is, is Rick Harrison charged the American Pickers to go out and find a 57 Chevy, which is his dad's favorite car. He used to own one back when he was in high school and, and all that stuff. He said, Pickers, go out and find me one, and I'll buy it. I'll pawn it to myself, and then I'm going to hand it over, you know, to, to uh, whatever that guy's name, Rick Dale, and uh, American Restoration, and have them fix it up. So I thought, this is pretty cool. This would be a lot of fun. So the pickers go out. They find an old, abandoned, rusted, ugly 57 Chevy, and they buy it for five grand. Well, that's not bad. I mean, that's a big birthday present, if you ask me, but the guy's rich. That's fine. So five grand, and they sell it to Rick Harrison at Pond Stars for 8500 8, I was like, that's awesome. How do you do that? You know, I'm in the wrong business, sense, but that's, that's just really cool. So he buys it for 8500 and I'm thinking that's a lot of money, but, you know, it's, he's rich. He can do it. So he hands it over to Rick Dale, and they're having to go out and do, restore and get all this thing done in a, in a certain measure of time. And as you go through the show, the price of this car keeps going click, 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 up higher and higher and higher. And it gets to the point where he looks at Rick Harrison and he says, dude, this thing's going to cost you over 70 k to finish. I thought, this dude must really want to make his dad happy. <laughs> and that's when it hit me. Jesus knows how bad your Father in heaven wants to see you restored to your original beauty. And he didn't give 70K. He gave it all away. He looked at us on the side of the road and said, I'm all in. I don't know how we do anything else but honor that love and sacrifice by prioritizing what he's made possible and then just very practically assessing what is our next step with you, Jesus. 
and going for it. Look what it says here, the last, last two verses. Therefore, Jesus, or therefore, my brothers, because of what Jesus has done, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Give evidence of what has happened in your life. For if you do these things, you will never fail, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for my family. That's what I want for you. That aside, that's what God wants for you. That's what Jesus has done for you. So what are you going to do with that? What am I going to do with that? Let me take you back to Roach, Missouri for a second. I mentioned to you that I saw an old firebird laying there in the junk. We saw a picture of it earlier. I'm going to bring a picture up here on the screen of that old firebird and one that's been restored. Why have these pictures up here? Because I want you this week and in months going ahead. Man, it'd be great when I'm 70 years old. Ryan, you remember that picture of the firebird you threw up there? That's hung around with me forever, you know? I would love for that to be the case, for God to burn this image into your mind. And when you get to that place where you're asking yourself, am I going to dishonor Christ and just trust that he'll forgive me tomorrow? Or am I going to pursue holiness because he loves me so much? I hope that you'll see and remember the restored vehicle and the one that's left to rust. Let me just get personal with you for one moment. My title here is Discipleship Pastor, Grow Pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm tasked to help you grow and to be fully restored into that image of God. Our team, there's five of us, we have been praying for each of you. Two times a year, the opportunity comes around for people to find their way into a community of Christ-like believers around very particular topics for you to get in and take your next step with Christ, we pray and we fast, asking God, not just to get you into a group of believers, but to get you into the right group. This is our passion. This is Christ's passion. So we implore you with all of our hearts and the mind of Christ, to ask God for your next step and take it. If you've been in a life group before, I trust that you'll prioritize your next step over anything else when you choose your group. And right outside here in the commons are our, all of our you know, grow team and, and other uh, group leaders out there. There's packets of all the available groups that are opening up for this fall. Take a packet, go home, pray through that, ask God, what's the next step? And sign up. Sign up this week. Sign up before Tuesday, okay? If God's told you what that is. If you've not been in a group before and that whole idea freaks you out, you're not alone, one. But two, we've got an opportunity for you. I'm going to be at 12.30 today and then Wednesday night and Thursday night of this week at 6.30. Uh, uh, Wednesday night and today at 12.30, I'm going to be in that room. Pastor Dan's going to be there. We're going to have that get connected thing we were talking about earlier in the pulse. It's a get connected that you take your first step with Jesus at Westside Family Church and we'll help you discern some next steps after that. Prioritize that. Take that next step. And let's watch God get glory and fame as we're brought back into that image that he created us to be. Let's pray together. Jesus, all glory and praise and honor to you who, though scorn was coming and though pain was coming, considered it all rubble and walked past it and through it, enduring the cross and all the shame and the pain so that your death with our sin could be our spiritual death and that your resurrection could be our new life in you. Let us be restored into your image for your glory and for your fame. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.